Thank you, Francisco. Um, I'm really excited to present <coughs> um, a good friend of mine and a wonderful healer <coughs> this evening, Tara Manji. We just determined that we, we don't quite remember where we met. And I was listening to like something online. I think it was like Black Star. It was like most deaf and Talib Kweli talking about they didn't really remember how they met and sometimes like really good friendships, you can't quite pinpoint that moment because the thing feels like it's gone on for quite a while. And that's the case with Tara. Um, I've had uh, the privilege of receiving treatment from Tara. She's an acupuncturist. Um, we've done barters, but she's always, you know, for me, one of the ways I identify a healer is someone who's really invested, really interested, and really comes from the heart, is really an, an, an empath. Um, so, so Tara's always, you know, since we're friends, it's just always, I'm not putting this out to everyone, <laughs> but she's always worked on me, like regardless of, you know, whether I had money at the time or not, and was just always interested in, in the healing and the wellness and the well-being. Um, that to me is um, the people who I really con consider genuine healers really come from that place uh, of, of deep care. Um, so I appreciate that about you, Tara. In terms of her professional background, I'll share a little bit. As I mentioned, Tara is an acupuncturist. She's the founder of Acculibrium Acupuncture, which is a Nairobi-based practice. Um, she graduated with honors from University of Westminster, Westminster in the UK, which is a leading acupuncture degree program. Um, she's got 15 years of clinical experience, maybe more, I think, but I think this is accurate, 15 years. Um, with postgraduate uh, specialization in acupuncture for infertility um, and acupuncture during pregnancy, which um, I think is, is a bit rare. I hadn't come across someone who really specialized in that, that field before meeting Tara. Um, she's also a member of the British Acupuncture Council and the Kenya Fertility Society. Um, and her, her, her work is recognized as well through the Kenyan Ministry of Health. So I'm really excited for this, uh, this presentation tonight. I've uh, been able to share space with Tara and some of the other local events uh, we do here in Nairobi, including the Nairobi uh, Wellness Festival, um, where she shared some of her thoughts around traditional Chinese medicine and its healing properties. So thank you so much for joining us Tara this evening, and I'm excited to hand the, the mic, the space over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Salim, for the glowing reference. I feel <laughs> quite, I don't know who you're talking about there. <laughs> the clamp. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, actually, for being here tonight, for giving me the space to share, for taking the time to to engage and, um, and to be part of this amazing community. Um, I'm really excited about tonight's talk because it's something that interests me a lot. And it's something I don't actually get a chance to talk about very much um, because I get so wrapped up in clinical practice. But part of the enjoyment for me isn't just treating people, although that's part of it, but it's also you know, the whole spectrum of Chinese medicine, which incorporates literature, which incorporates art, which incorporates philosophy. Um, there's so many facets to this amazing paradigm. And, um, and I always get bogged down with the clinical details and never get a chance to share. So, so it's really wonderful for me to be here tonight as well. Um, I'm gonna start by saying what I want to do. I have a, you know, I was actually at a lecture yesterday, it was a psychology lecture um, of which I was a participant. And one of the things that really frustrated me as I was telling Salim today was it just bugged the hell out of me that I was listening and I couldn't ask questions and I couldn't engage and it was just driving me bananas. So I would like everyone to come off mute, please. And, um, and I'd like this to be an interactive discussion. Like, you know, there's lots of big ideas that I'm gonna be throwing out and big concepts. And, um, and it will be really nice if we can share and, um, you know, and have dialogue together on that. I'm just gonna take a moment to try, I learned how to do this today, but I seem to have forgotten how. I'm trying to just get this PowerPoint up. Oh, you need to get, um, Francisco will 
um, make you the co-host or the host, Tara. Um, okay. So that's first. And then, and then in the meantime, I would say that it's actually better if people are on mute, and then as they have questions, they unmute, because there's okay. a lot of background noise otherwise. It will be distracting to you if, if you hear too much um, from people's ambient situations. <laughs> yeah, so please feel free to jump in and interrupt then. If you're on mute, please feel free to jump in and, and interrupt. Um, so Francisco will make you um, the host or co-host. And then you'll go to the bottom of your screen and you'll just go to share screen. There we go. He's on it. See it? Cool. Okay, so the title of the talk I'm doing tonight is called Yang Sheng, and it's the Taoist philosophy of self-care. Um, and if you look at this first little screen, you can see all these people doing all these exercises. Um, and, and it's a really beautiful little painting. And this is actually one of the Mawang Dui scrolls. And um, the, Mawang Dui, the Mawang Dui archaeological site is a really important archaeological dig site, which holds the tomb of a Han Dynasty family. And it was very, very well preserved. So this, what you're seeing on screen is actually paintings on silk. And, um, and it, it's basically a Qigong reference guide. Um, and it was found in the tomb of these noble people who died, basically, um, along with medical texts, copies of religious texts, foodstuffs, precious objects, etc. But it is a Yangsheng manuscript. And it just gives you an idea of how important Yangsheng was in the TCM paradigm. Yangsheng means nurturing life. And it's basically the idea of self-care. It's about taking care of yourself as an integral part of healing. Um, so in biomedicine, sorry, I'm having trouble with the, I think I've done this now, sorry. In biomedicine, self-care is defined as useful, but not essential to medical care. Um, and TCM views things very, very differently. It views self-care or nurturing life in terms of Yang Sheng as the most crucial of interventions. It's an integral part of medical treatment. It's the first and most important part of medical treatment. Um, and these different views are due to the sociocultural environments in which the paradigms evolved. So what I mean here is in the words of Alan Wilson Watts, we think of ter in terms of languages and images which we did not invent, but which were given to us by our society. So what that means is that if we have a society, facets of that society are going to form our individual worldviews and the worldviews as a culture. And religion is a huge part of that. So if, um, Religion will influence science, it will influence philosophy, and science and philosophy will influence each other, and it will also influence you on a personal level. But irrespective of whether you follow a religion or not, it will still influence your worldview because of the way that you grew up, because of the values that have been put on you um, by your society. So the biomedical model is influenced by theistic concepts. So Theistic or theism is the idea of worshiping God. Uh, sorry, I'm really nervous. I never usually talk on a computer. So, Tara, um, so Tara really, this is great information. <laughs> First of all, let me just chime in. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm, I, I feel like, I mean, this is really beautiful content and I'm really I'm taking it all in, you know, so take your time. This is fantastic. Um, you know, I feel like I have questions about some things already, but uh, I really appreciate, and the slides are great too. So thank you so much. Keep it going. Okay. So um, thank you, Francisco. Um, so yeah, so as I was saying, theism is the idea of worshiping a God. And, and what that means is that there's an omnipotent authority who takes care of you. Who, who watches over everything and who will take your problems away if you appeal to them. 
And the biomedical model reflects this. Now, the biomedical model evolved in the Renaissance period in Europe, and, um, and it's through something called enlightenment philosophy, which I'm not actually going to go into now because it will take forever. But, um, but it was influenced by theism. And if you take that idea of an omnipotent being um, who takes care of you and takes away your problems, the biomedical model does that. The physician is there to heal you, to take away your problems. So you go there as a passive recipient of care. And disease is viewed as separate to a person. So it's something that can be taken away. It's not part of you. You take away the symptoms. You heal the suffering. And, and that's very much um, based in the theistic model of, of illness. The, oh, sorry, I don't know how to rewind. Let me just stop share and then I'll try again. Um, but uh, let's maybe, let's pause for a second if anyone has any questions before you keep going. Um, how are you guys doing? Cool, let's keep flowing. <laughs> yeah, you keep flowing. Oh, sorry, I keep, um, I keep forwarding these slides and I don't know how to take them back. It's okay. so I'm yeah, if you go to your PowerPoint, you could look at your, you're working from PowerPoint, yeah? Yeah. Do you see the thumbnails on the side? You could do it that way. Uh, um. Yeah. Okay. So, so we've talked about the biomedical model, which is based in theism. And now we're going to look at the TCM model. Um, can you guys see the screen? Like, do you see what I'm seeing? Or do you see all these little tabs and things? That we I'm see the sociocultural influences of the TCM paradigm. Um, okay. The bulleted list right below that and to the right, a really beautiful image. Okay, so that image, I'll start with that image because I like that image too. That image is actually um, a map of internal circulation. That is a map of the body um, oh, wow. according <laughs> to Chinese medicine, ancient Chinese medicine. So this is the insides of the body and you see here, like these are the lungs, you have the mountain air, and um, all of that. Here you have the sea of water and grain, and here you have the drainage ditch, which is basically the elimination process. So these are the intestines here. And, um, and the reason they used to look at things in this way is because they look at the world from a Taoist model, not from a theistic model. So Taoism developed out of animist worship, and animism is the idea of just believing that everything around you has an energy, a spirit, or um, a soul, so to speak. Um, but it's not the idea of worshipping one individual or one entity. Um, it's more like a reverence for the natural flow of the universe, and it forms the foundation of the TCM health paradigm. In fact, uh, TCM and Taoism evolved hand in hand. So. Okay. Unlike Western medicine, I'm going to use the terms Western and Orthodox and biomedical model. I'll interchange those terms, but basically they all mean the same thing, as opposed to TCM, which is traditional Chinese medicine. So the Western medical model views diseases as something which are separate from the individual. Gotcha. But um, TCM views everything as interconnected. So disease isn't separate to us, it's part of our existence. And healthcare isn't viewed in terms of eliminating symptoms because, because it's part of us. So the emphasis instead is on cultivating vitality, balance and harmony, so disease is less likely to manifest. And you can see, this is a quote from Sun Tsi Miao, who was um, a very noted uh, physician, um, I think in the Ming Dynasty, I can't remember, but he says to be skilled at nurturing one's nature is to treat disease before it arises. So the idea was to stop it from manifesting. And to me, this ties in with science in a big way as well, because there's something called epigenetics, which I find very interesting personally. And epigenetics is how gene sequences are expressed. So we all have genes and they could be for cancer they could be for low immunity they could be for arthritis you know they could be for really great longevity as well but how they are expressed will deter will be determined on your behaviors um, so for example in studies on rats 
they saw that um, tail kinks and coat color were directly affected by what the mother rats were fed. So if you fed the mother, mother rat something, it would get a curly tail. And if you fed it, some, the babies would get a curly tail. And if you fed the mother rat something else, they would have a straight tail or they'd be brown or white or whatever. So the, there's a direct influence on what you do and how things like disease will manifest in the future and even in the present. So, so yeah. So wow. anyway. Uh, let's stop for a second there. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. So does anyone have any questions um, regarding that last slide that you want to share? And I have a couple of comments here, just a lot of people, like people commenting on, on the content, on your content, Tara. So really appreciating your content. Let's keep flowing then. I, okay. One thing that did stand out to me, and I, I do want you to keep going, but I never really thought about the specific connection that you seem to make between like theism and the relationship to the physician and how the physician kind of, you know, plays this kind of godlike, you know, role in terms of, you know, that person having power. I thought that was really fascinating, actually. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's something that's still taught um, in, in medical school today. I mean, paradigms always evolve. So this paradigm is shifting as well. But, um, but it is still taught, like, you know, that term physician, uh, patient is a passive recipient of care is actually a quote from a medical textbook. Uh, called the Family Textbook of Internal Health, um, which is still used as a medical text in some medical schools today. So, wow. so yeah. Um, and now there's this shift towards patient-centered care, um, but it's still very much you are receiving as opposed to you are taking control yeah. of health. Yeah. Uh, gosh. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to go back again. Okay. Okay, so what is the Tao? I've been talking about the Tao and I've been talking about Taoism. So what is the Tao? The Tao is basically um, the universal guiding principles, I guess, is a way to describe it. It's, it's an accumulation of knowledge and it's attributed to Lao Tzu, who was a Zhu dynasty scholar. And this is a picture of him here. And I really particularly love this little painting because many paintings will depict Lao Tzu on an ox, on a water buffalo. And the reason for that is because he was a courtier in, um, in the Chinese court and he was really fed up with the corruption and with the dissolution of that society and he decided to just go away and the idea is that he got onto a water buffalo this is the story that is dead he got onto a water buffalo and he walked away but he was stopped by a border guard who recognized him and said write down your wisdom or i won't let you pass and that's how the tao te ching which is the principal text of taoism is supposed to have come about and the reason i love this photo as an aside or this painting is because if you see some of the other paintings of Lao Tzu, he all looks like this super sage. He's there on his buffalo, like going off into the sunset, like, you know. And here, he's just like, I'm so done. You can see even his buffalo looks tired. He's like, I'm out of here, <laughs> you know. And, and I think that's really reflective of what I'm going to be talking about, which is about nurturing your nature, honoring what you feel inside. So if the... Tao Te Ching is the universal guiding principles or text that guides Taoism. Taoism can be said to be an accumulation of generations of knowledge collated by multiple authors. You know, Lao Tzu is said to have written it, but actually that's been proven not to be true. And there's even some question marks about whether he actually existed or is a mythical, is a mythical, um, being. So Tao means way, way or root uh, or, or path, I guess. Yeah, root meaning R-O-U-T-E. It's, it's the direction that you flow in. And, um, and if you describe the Tao, this is what's written in the Tao Te Ching. There was something undefined and complete coming into existence before heaven and earth. 
and um, it may be regarded as the mother of all things. I do not know its name, and I give it the designation of the Tao, which means the way. To further give it a name, I call it the Great. And basically, this is the, ex this is the explanation of how existence came into being. And some scholars say it equates to the Big Bang Theory. Um, you know, they say there was nothing, and then something came, and it goes back, like there's lots of things about yin and yang, which I'm not gonna go into now as well, but you know, just saying that there was nothing, and then there was something, and everything evolved from this. Um, okay, so the law of the Tao, does that make sense? Please, guys, do yeah, feel free. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it speaks to a lot of like creation stories too, you know, like there was nothing, and then there was sound, you know, like, uh, like even in <laughs> yoga, like the sound of Om, um and you know it's yes it's definitely resonating <laughs> uh thank you no and i think as well, um sorry. sorry no i was gonna say and i think as well if you look at um you know say the sanskrit texts and yeah. these i think evolved in parallel you know there's a lot of cross or correlation between say uh, the Buddhist texts, for example, or um, some of the ancient um, Hindu sutras, you know, and this as well. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, in Cuba, in Cuba, there's a saying like uh, "si no es dingo es mandingo," you know. It's like <laughs> there's we all have these like parallel stories that are re very reflective of each other, you know. Absolutely, and I think that's what's so beautiful because, y you know, I'm reading about all this stuff and I'm finding it interesting. But what I also find interesting is that you can correlate it. It's human, it speaks to people. You know? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, oh. I don't wanna interrupt you, uh, let's keep going. I mean, I think all of this, I feel like from what you're saying and I felt this from a lot of the different sanghas, like we could do like three more presentations, um, like a series, you know, and I think eventually, you know, with Salim and I, we've been talking a little bit more about that down the road um you know I, I there's so much beautiful content part of me also wants to sh share more with everyone like the self-care stuff because i think right now a lot of people like need that self-care um so i really love how you're setting it up thank you tara okay so if we go to self-care actually that's this slide here um Man takes his law from the earth. The earth takes its law from heaven. Heaven takes its law from the Tao. And the law of the Tao is it's being what it is. It is what it is, it's human nature. So if Tao means root, root or way, Taoism is used to describe the idea of learning from the world around you and gaining wisdom through everyday experiences. And two really important concepts within that is ziran, our innate nature. And that could be something like breathing. You know, you are born and you take your first breath and then it comes spontaneously, automatically. That's the unadulterated way. That's the Tao. That is who we are. The second way, oh, sorry, I keep doing that, is I can't say this without laughing because I can't pronounce it properly. So feel free to laugh with me is Wu Wei, <laughs> which is se second nature. And um, basically, I would say that's being mindful or intentional. So doing things until they become as natural to you as breathing. I find that sometimes with yoga, when you get into yoga and everything is syncopated with breath, with movement, with asana, everything and suddenly it becomes automatic that is to me wu wei um, another way that you can look at wu wei is to practice healthy habits until they become second nature so yeah. so Tara, it's a bit I, like Tara, Tara, yeah go ahead no um you know it's it's interesting i, I really relate to what you're saying regarding yoga with with the second nature because even you know, starting this platform, a lot of people are having to get used to doing things online, right? Um, mm -hmm. And doing it on a screen. And it's like, a, initially, when we first started doing this, it was really, it definitely was not second nature. Um, and, and, and it was really a little bit challenging for people. Um, but it was the but it was an instrument that we had uh, to evoke self care. And, you know, really, 
expand community and around positive dialogue, right? Because um, we're being fed a lot of different information um, that disrupts that kind of calm serenity of mind. Um, so yeah, with Second Nature, I've, I've you know with people I'm talking to, just getting them to start their practice and share again. It's really challenging for them, and now it's really beautiful. Four months that we've been practicing together, kind of seeing that evolve and grow. Um, so it definitely yes. speaks to me. Yeah. But, um, indeed, yeah. and, and it's applicable to so many things. Um, you know, if we go back to this idea of Yang Sheng of self-care and nurturing life, and if we say that nurturing life should come like second nature, like Wu Wei. So we look at the world around us to give us inspiration to find that. And then we just practice it and cultivate it and embrace it until we just find it becomes part of ourselves, whether it's eating well, whether it's deep breathing, whether it's yoga, whether it's connecting via online computer and, and getting used to it. Um, it's all part of self-care. It is about mindfulness and intention for want of a, like, you know, that's a simple way to put it, but it is about this just going with the flow, but not in a mindless way. It's going with the flow and being in the zone, so to speak. Um, so Yang Sheng, this is um, a quote from the Su Wen, or, which is actually the Yellow Emperor's Treatise of Classic Medicine. Sorry, I'm garbling that. But basically, it's the first um, or primary TCM text that was written. It's about 3,000 years old. And they say to know the way is to know the way um, of self-cultivation. So TCM views pain and illness as a disharmony and seeks to restore balance in order to re-establish wellness. But this is the second step to health because the true Tao to help, the true way to health is Yang Sheng. In ancient China, people, doctors were given retainers to keep people well. They were not paid if people got sick. And there was actually a hierarchy as well of who was paid. So the acupuncturists were way at the bottom of the list and the surgeons were way at the bottom of the list um, because the true maintainers of health were the teachers. And that goes, you know, you were saying about like that correlation uh, with stuff you've learned as well, Francisco, things like, um, you know, the Dharma, the Buddha. So the teachers, the Taoist masters, were the highest paid healthcare like practitioners wow. because they people have to stay well. Yeah. And, and and the rest was damage control. Like, you know, the acupuncturists were called in like at the end when everything was too late, if you know, if the job hadn't been done properly. And there's another like anecdotal story, which I thought was quite sweet actually, um, where doctors had to light a lantern outside their houses for every person that died or didn't get well. So you always avoided a well-lit doctor's surgery. Like this is in ancient China because you knew they would mess up. Whereas, um, you know, if you were taught how to stay well, um, then you didn't necessarily have to get to the point. That's really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> like just that, like, um, you know, they were revered for, you know, preventative medicine, you, be, you know, prevent you know, keeping the, keeping people well, not, not, um, wow. That's really powerful shift of perspective of medicine, you know? Um, yes. And, and that's why I wanted to just bring in very briefly that idea of the theistic model, because that's not wrong either, but it is a very different perspective. And, you know, there's a lot of um, stuff out there saying things like, oh, Yang Sheng is a scam, for example, or what is the point of Yang Sheng? That's just common sense. But there's this whole idea that actually this is the most important bit um, it's not just something you do as a luxury. It's something you do as part of everyday life. And if you do it and you prevent, you optimize health, then you won't have to resort to being taken care of because that's all within you. Hmm. So wellness was maintained through teaching people the skills to nurture life by honoring the way. Um, and um, 
This was done. Sorry, every time I try and I don't know. I'm really sorry about how useless no I am. It's the chaos is beautiful, Tara. We are, we appreciate chaos over here. It's, it's yeah. It'll become Wu Wei the next the next tool. <laughs> That's good. Tie it in. Well, one, as, as you're navigating, like something that came to mind that Francisco mentioned in terms of like, like the work we're doing with Synergy, a kind of byproduct is that we have all these people who are now doing a home practice, in a sense, mm -hmm. right. you know, like just by fact of circumstance. Of course, the computer's there, but if they were to kind of turn the laptop down, it'd still be doing a home practice. And I, I love the idea that that's something that maybe getting used to see, creating space in your home. People are kind of creating different spaces to practice yoga, to do Taoist meditation, which we are doing now with, with Joshua. So that, that to me is a beautiful thing that the home is becoming now like in a sense what people might go to this, have gone to the studio for. Um, and so there is an integration as at least in this community that we're working with um, at, at, this, at this particular time that we're in, which is very interesting, you know unintended or unplanned, at least for us, kind of byproduct of the circumstances. Yeah, and I'd like to comment on that, Tara, um, briefly. Like, you know, I went to go visit my sister. She has five kids and, um, you know, they're all inside and they were playing Fortnite. And it's a kind of a game that took on off in the United States. I don't know globally, but it was definitely a big thing. And people, all these kids were encouraged to like be sitting inside looking at the computer, you know, and uh playing these games now the you know what talking to my sister she's like well it's great because they can s connect with their friends you know um and and on a regular basis uh, but in a way that tool is uh you know but they're sitting down moving their thumbs kind of hunched over on the on the game and i think now it's it's a matter of using these tools uh for like shifting it you know um, so that we use these tools for, for wellness, you know, and I think that's kind of what we're doing now. Um, my hope with what you're saying is that everything makes a circle is that we go back to this reverence of, 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 um, uh, a natural way, uh, through a different medicinal approach, you know? Um, I think a lot of the conversations that are happening now around vaccines and all these different things are, are making us really be more thoughtful about, the medicinal systems that we have embraced and how they haven't served us at times, you know? Um, and I really love like everything you're talking about evokes a lot of romance and aspiration for me as, as far as like self care, you know, and making that th the most important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Putting I, have an a I have a question. Sorry, go for it. Yeah. yeah go ahead and respond first and I'll ask it. Uh, no, uh, no, please ask first. I'll, I'll come back to it. It was just conversation, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm loving this presentation. Thank um, you. It, uh, it's really uh, uh, enlightening. You are very, really enlightening. Uh, my question is, if, if um, something isn't Xeron or Wu Wei, if mm -hmm. it isn't in innate or if it isn't second nature, where, what is it? And where does it fit within this system, within the system of thought? So basically, where it fits in is um, that it's part of what is going to be affecting you. So things like uh, an example would be, let's say anxious breathing. I'm doing it now. I'm going to give a personal example. Okay. So Ziran, it's my nature to breathe. Yeah. But... Now, I'm breathing very anxiously. That's not the most efficient way to breathe. The idea to breathe is to nourish your cells, to bring in oxygen. But now I'm breathing fast and my heart is racing and it's affecting me. So the idea would be to practice deep breathing, mindful breathing until it becomes second nature, not to allow external factors to influence you. And the way that Taoists would say is what is Ziran, what is way is to look at nature. So for example, if you look at a baby, a baby fast asleep, or you look at an animal, I have pets and it's quite sweet to see them sleeping, but, or, or even just lying down and relaxing and they breathe very deeply and very slowly and very calmly and they go into this sense of Zen. 
and um, and it's beautiful to see, and it just brings about this, this calm. So by observing that, you see the right way to breathe. You know how to do it because you did it as a baby yourself. Um, but because there's disruption, because the world is in a sense of flux all the time, the universe is throwing things at you all the time, you may not be in a state of zero and you may not be in a state of wu wei or wu wei can also be, you know, it doesn't have to be healthy. So it can be second nature to breathe anxiously all the time or to be stressed or to, you know, to, um, to push yourself beyond your, your physical means, you know, running on empty, working too hard, all those things. That is also wu wei. And that's what uh. it comes down if you if you look at um, you know the sign of the yin yang, which I'm going to be coming to next, and the idea of Taoism is that everything is there. It's this idea that disease or disharmony isn't something bad. It's just something that's there. The same way that good stuff is there. You Great. know. Thank, thank well, you. That's really helpful. Finding the balance between between that and accepting it as well, but also in accepting it, learning to rise above it. Thank you. And, and take control of it. Yeah, sorry, did that um, yes, answer? Yes, because I think most people are in that space in our world, unfortunately. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, yeah, and it is about um, acknowledging that that space is there, and then that can become second nature, and then to, to change that. That's where Yang Sheng comes in, to nurture life, rather than to nurture stuff that causes you to leak jing, let's say, or to lose energy or to, you know, damage yourself in any way. Um, cultivate that, to cultivate what supports life and provides longevity. To nurture um, life. Did you have a question, Francisco? No, I'm just, I was just echoing. To nurture life, yes. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I'm talking quite fast, I think. And um, if anyone wants to, you know, share or to, um, you know, clarify anything or whatever, please feel free. So, shall I carry on? Please. Okay. Yeah, feel free. So, in order to honor the way, to find balance, the concepts of yin and yang, and qi and blood, and also the wuxing, uh, or five phases, um, were devised, or, or, you know, this is part of the Taoist doctrines. Um, and I'm a bit nervous about talking about the wuxing now, because there's a very respected five element acupuncturists among us tonight. And thank you very much for coming, Ketan. Um, and I hope you'll add to this. But, um, oh, sorry, I keep doing it. <laughs> okay, so the principles, of yin and yang. Um, this is a reflection of harmony and balance. So yin has its root in yang, sorry, yang has its root in yin, yin has its root in yang. Without yin, yang cannot arise. Without yang, yin cannot be born. So they work in harmony together. That's from the Neijing, again, like the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine. But there's something in the Tao as well which describes this. Um, and it says, it's quite beautiful, I think, if I can just find it. Um, sorry, I can't find it, so I'll have to talk to you about it later. <laughs> um, in any case, so yin and yang move into each other, and that's why you have these little dots um, in the center here. Can you see yes. these little um, Because there's a part of darkness in all of us. Uh, this is going back to your question, Brian, you know, about Wu Wei and where is it? it? It is there, whether it's dark or whether it's light, but dark isn't necessarily bad. It's just part of us. And light isn't necessarily always good, you know, too much heat, too much yang can also be detrimental. Um, so when they're in balance, you have good health. So the idea is to keep everything in harmony. And when there's imbalance, you get disease. Um, and here's some qualities of yin, so earth, cooling, nourishing, nurturing, the inner organs, the front of the body, introspection, water, and blood. And yang is warming, masculine, 
energizing, heating, sunlight and fire and chi. So I, I'd like you guys to think of some things and behaviors, thinking about yin and yang, <clears throat> You know, which behaviors do you think might cultivate yin? Which do you think might cultivate yang? Um, and ways in, in which you can apply the concept of yin and yang to aspects of your own life. Uh, so it's a very simple way of implementing yang sheng. You know, you were saying, Francisco, about moving into this direction of self-care. And this is a simple way to do it. You don't need major tools. You just need to see where am I imbalanced and try and think about ways in simple ways to balance it. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so if anyone, you know, wants to share what they're thinking about there, I'm going to leave the floor for a few minutes uh, to, to see if anyone else wants to. So, so the question is like, where am I in balance? Correct. And where, yeah. Yeah. Where are you imbalanced? And, and where are you unbalanced? And, um, you know, like, and in terms of yin and yang, so do you feel like there's too much yang energy in you? Are you just pushing yourself very hard and whatever? Do you need to cultivate yin or vice versa? You know, maybe you're quite introspective and, and so, a bit of... Mm. Question to the group, and uh, let's give everyone 30 seconds to think about it <laughs> and maybe write mm -hmm. it down if you think that's appropriate. Um, and then we can maybe open it up to the group a little wider. Does that make sense to you, Tara? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you're, you're giving the group a chance to answer. That's what I'm hoping people will do. Come on, guys. So, so China, 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 China. you know, um, Tara just um, kind of echoed her question again or, to the group. And, um, you know, I feel that just in kind of putting yourself out there and sharing a little bit of that, will give you a little guidance from, from someone who's extremely passionate and holds a lot of reverence to, to this art form and, and a lot of respect to this. So it's wonderful to get some guidance from Tara. If you guys have anything you want to share. One, one of the things that stands out to me, um, Tara, which I kind of know, know in theory, but seeing it here, it, it resonates even more, is that the, the idea of them transforming the fluidity of yin and yang. Um, that it's not stagnant. I mean, life isn't stagnant. And we <clears throat> often get into this, you know, self-identification of like what we are, you know, um, whether it's gender, whatever the case. Um, but this is kind of presenting something very different, um, yeah. you know, in terms of the fact that, you know, the, 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 that, that they, there's, they merge at times or transform. I mean, you said it perfectly, this transformation. So that's, that's just like a wonderful reminder, and even in terms of our own behaviors and habits, you know, you know, you're talking about, for example, overexerting, overworking, a common thing in, in the West, I think in Western philosophy in general, that you just kind of grind, I'm from the, born in the U.S., and that's always kind of a part of, you know, with the work ethic, you know, this work ethic thing, of like, go, go, go. Um, and, you know, it's like too much yang, it's just like too, you know, so... So that's, that's beautiful. It just kind of resonated with me at a certain level. Yeah, totally. And, um, you know, to give an example again of myself, to be, you know, I found it difficult to switch on the lights today. I know a bunch of times when I've done yoga classes with you guys, um, I've always had the lights really low because I can't have all that light. I'm, you know, very introspective and it's just overwhelming for me. So today there was this transformation. I'm there i'm you know in the light i'm talking to people i'm so it is transformation and maybe you know that will transform again um you know tomorrow when i do my practice or whatever but it's it's never the universe is never stagnant there's always that we may be stagnant but the universe isn't and it's about like just recognizing that yeah. that we don't have to be stuck in a right. certain way in our mindset or um Tara, so there's a this is Caitlin. I just wanted to uh, congratulate you on the talk, but also add a couple of thoughts I had as I was listening to this really nice um, piece on Yang Sheng. Is that I remember back in school, and I'm sure you remember hearing this too, that you have to think of Yin and Yang like an oil lamp. That you need one to make the other. Without the oil, you can't have the flame. The oil yeah. being the yin, the flame being the yang, and it's just so important because a lot of times our medicine 
becomes um, kind of polarized or, you know, turned into a duality. Am I yin? Am I yang? Am I this? Am I that? It's never that at all. It's always the two that come together that create, you know, the brightness. And so, you know, it's, it's, I feel that you, you probably notice this in your own work that, you know, we spend a lot of time hearing people say, oh, well, I'm too this and I'm too that. But you have to remember that we're going back for balance. We need to have a little bit of everything, you know, a little bit of activity and a little bit of quiet, you know, a little bit of, um, I don't know, popcorn, a little bit of tea. Like you can't do one without the other. You need both. And then the other one that, um, the other piece that was coming to mind for me that I was so shocked about learning in, you know, acupuncture school is that even over joy is a problem, right? It's not just overwork or over anxious, over joy. Everybody says, oh, well, joy is good. So that can't be bad. But anything in excess or anything in um, vacuity or what do you call it, deficiency has the potential to create dis-ease and from dis-ease over time, repetitive patterns will lead us to disease. So just a few points to throw in there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that um, analogy of the lamp and the flame is, is brilliant. And it goes to the three jewels as well of, um, you know, of TCM, which is Shen, Qi, and Ping. So if you have that lamp, the Shen is the spirit, and you can't have the spirit, brightness, as you said, Kitten, without having that yin and yang. One has to feed into the other in, in perfect harmony to get, you know, that beautiful light in your life. Yeah. Uh, we do, uh, Tara, have a comment here from Lena. She finds that as a woman, there's often a feeling uh, that she's got to push, push uh, a lot like a man at work. Uh, she says, you know, sometimes like the male energy is associated with that pushing at work. Um, so, yeah, any comment? And, and, I, and what I'm in the, I think it's in reverence to like her losing her balance. It, I'm, I'm assuming it's to that question that you posed earlier. Um, yeah. So, so it is about finding the balance and, you know, um, it's about acknowledging as well. I think if we use the universe as the guiding force, as the guiding principle and the environment that perhaps, although it's not ideal, this is the environment in which we live for one, um, which, you know, may not be, you know, there is this idea that you have to push because we live in a culture where you have to push, where you have to strive, where you have to overexert yourself. But it's then finding the discipline to say, if I'm doing that, how am I going to find my balance in other ways? How am I going to honor my needs in other ways um, and nourish and put my boundaries up and, and cultivate my health and put a value on that? Yeah. You know, so it, it's about acknowledging that maybe you are doing that, but you know, you can't necessarily stop it on right. one level. But you have to find ways to balance it. Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a really nice way to think about it. Uh, Lena, do you want to comment anything to that? Because um, usually we think if we're doing something wrong, we have to stop it, like you say, or something that doesn't mm -hmm. serve, we have to stop it. But I really like the perspective of, of you know, sometimes we, we have to push because whatever the life circumstances, um, but how do we cultivate those tools around us? Uh, Lena says that that really helps. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Asante for coming. Um, some of this, Tara, to me, points mm -hmm. to like, a kind, we can say there's a, a kind of, there is somewhat of a, um, a global culture, you know, that's, that's largely, in my opinion, been influenced by certain philosophies coming out of the West that, is oriented around productivity, um, which to me can can really be harm. You know, is the feeling this the feeling like we always have to be, you know. I mean, we've said it a hundred times, you know, but always have to be doing, always have to be, and also the judgment that if you're not being hyper productive, that that's a bad thing. I feel like you know, COVID has kind of like like this pandemic has actually really slowed that process down a lot because a lot of people have just had to slow down 
you know, they've had to kind of like respond in, in certain ways. But it just brings a lot of that up for me personally, is like, you know, kind of the bigger picture in terms of where our trajectory is, right, as a species, and also certain ideas that we function under that kind of push us to, to certain points of exhaustion, you know, um, as individuals and as a society. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, it, it's, you know, it goes back to that um, idea of change. You know, if you push, 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 eventually it will collapse. And Corona was a sign of that. Right. For decades or millennial, millenniums, or whatever it is, however long it's been, hundreds of years, that's been the ethos, you know, and now it's shifting. It doesn't matter. It can be a shift within a minute yeah within your immediate moment or it can be a shift over thousands of years or it can be a shift you know i mean even things like say falling down with a heart attack is a shift if you've been overworking but it's not the kind of shift you want to get so you want to find the way of managing that i guess mm. in in light of the fact that we are in this culture um that that doesn't necessarily honor that per se, you know, there's a quote by Robin Sharma, and I can't remember it exactly, but he said something like self-care isn't an indulgence. It's, it's an investment in your own good health. And uh, I mean, in your own productivity and in your workplace and in your family and everything by taking care of yourself, you're more productive. So it's about trying to shift the paradigm away from, okay, I've got to push and persevere. Actually, I've got to stop a bit, but then I'll be more productive in the time that I do work, in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, did someone have a question? I heard something. Um, no, I, I carry on? Yeah, I have, a, I have an yeah, observation. Go ahead, Go ahead Dan. Because um, I'm, I'm feeling my way in, into this and appreciating the importance of it. Um, I realize how this uh, theistic system, which I hadn't made the connection either, has put, placed me, put me in a place where I learned not to trust myself. That is, um, I was mm. trained by the culture to trust external whatever, from religion to medical systems to government and all of that. And, and the process is devastating at a certain level because I learned not to trust myself. Because the, the yin yang that I'm looking at is entirely an internal process. Yeah, I mean, it really is something I can do and for myself. I don't need external uh, anything, really. Maybe some teaching, um, you know. but this is very, very helpful. It re I mean, I'm on that path in any case, but to help me to continue to reframe uh, how I think about myself in this world and how. I've learned over the years to distrust my own impulses and intuitions and capacities and learn to rely on external and, and both for the good and the bad. So, I mean, that's a, those are judgmental words, but the, the things that I hold as good or bad in me or in the world. So, so thank you for this. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective, you know, um, and I love the way that you put that, like in terms of not trusting ourselves. And we are trained, we are, I, I hadn't thought of it that way as well, but it is true. Like we are trained to rely on people and not to rely on ourselves. But, you know, sometimes you may need to mm. ask for help. You know, sometimes mm. that is valid, but equally it's about beginning to understand what's in your control and what isn't and, and how to, to manage yourself you know rather than relying on systems and paradigms even to to take care of you as you said like you know whether it's a government system whether it's a healthcare system whether it's yeah, yeah. hi tara it, it, tara it's it's our chef um hi. by the way <laughs> hi sorry doing a great job so thank you and thank you for for inviting me on this um I guess what I'm struggling with a little bit is, and, and maybe you spoke to it because I've, I've um, and I may have missed it, was around the, uh, coming to this realization that you're, you're out of this balanced state and, and what are the techniques that we can do to 
<clears throat> to realize that and bring us back and what are uh, into into this balance i guess is 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 the question are there, are there specific techniques i know we talk about yoga and other and breathing and things like that but there's also um certain types of people that um sitting back and doing yoga can be stressful for them or as, as it is because they're the type of person that that they have to be doing something stressful or something very busy keeping very busy so which could be again detrimental to your health so you know what are the other techniques that you speak about to kind of come to this realization that you're out of balance okay so um so there's eight branches to yang sheng there's a whole book written on them and it, it was by a guy called gao lian but um but there's three main ones within that and the three main ones are and i didn't have slides on this unfortunately because i was talking a bit about the philosophy but you know thank you for that because i should have directed it into that way um but it is uh dietetics so diet physical cultivation which is exercise finding balance breathing exercises and all of that and also sexual cultivation um and they say that if you do all of these things then you will find balance but you know it's more about again going back to that idea of observing your nature going back to ziran what is normal and natural and in for you there's no one who is exactly the same in this world so what's right for you may not be right for someone else someone may need to have you know to be pushing themselves to be you know sort of more on an adrenaline buzz someone else may need to be more reserved there's no good or bad the techniques will depend on you some people may need to run some people may need to um eat well some people i mean well you all need to do that you know everyone needs to do that but you need to find it in a way that that works for you but also you know in in what you said like that it may be detrimental to acknowledge actually this is detrimental and if it's not the right way if that is the way that has become who way for you if that is the way that has become second nature um for you to find a different way of cultivating your health and the techniques um are anything that brings you back to balance to resilience to um optimized homeostatic balance i guess mm. so for me as if it could be breathing i know i mean i've said breathing a lot but for me breathing is a big one because i get very anxious so you know that brings me immediately into a parasympathetic state into a state of relaxation right. um for other people it may be that the only way they can relax is to do vigorous exercise you know mm. um it could be anything for another person it may be cooking for another person it may be reading or meditation but it's finding the balance between all of those things and also doing what's good for you so recognizing that just because reading feels good doesn't mean it's always going to be good if you do it all the time you have to do some physical stuff you right. know similar if you're doing loads of vigorous exercise that's also not good you know you have to find the balance between rest and and right. things like that but yeah cool thank Does you that Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we talked. Yeah. Hi. Um, no, I just wanted to um, echo on what Bryant was saying. Actually, like, I feel that, but I feel like um, now I realize. Um, you know, I was always externally looking for love externally. instead of having that self love for myself so that that really like that resonated with me so thank you for bringing that up you can reflect in so many different ways yeah <laughs> um in any case so i'll carry on we talked about um yin and yang and yin and yang manifest as qi and blood so if we say yin is blood and we say chi is yang and it kind of goes back to what ketan was saying about the oil and the flame i really love that analogy ketan um but you say that blood is the mother of chi and chi is the commander of blood you can't have one without the other and they feed into each other so if your blood is deficient if yin is deficient yang will be depleted and likewise if you are you know over exerting your yang and yang is deficient there will be nothing to build blood so they can't exist independently 
they nourish each other, but they also keep each other in check. And that's this idea of <clears throat> yin and yang. Um, and I just touched on this briefly because I think it's more interesting when you look at it in terms of yin and yang than, um, than qi and blood. That just becomes just boring and pathological. <laughs> But anyway, does anyone have questions on this? Otherwise, I'll move on. Does this make sense? Yes, it does. It's pretty clear. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so I'll move on. Um, so yeah, so the other um, the other way to find balance um, according to the Taoist doctrines, and Ketan, again, please feel free to chip in on this. Ketan's um, a five element acupuncturist, so she knows more about this. I do what's called eight principles, which goes into that yin and yang stuff from before. But this is really interesting. So the five elements, I, I prefer to use the word phases, actually, because we are constantly in a state of flux. So it's not these fixed elements, but it's phases within us. And this is the internal landscape. So if we say that we are a microcosm of the universe, which is what Taoism looks at. They say man is a microcosm of the universe and we reflect the universe within us. Um, then within that, we have all the aspects of the universe, fire, water, wood, earth, metal. So some people call them elements, but I like to say they're phases because everything changes. Wood will feed fire. Fire will nourish earth. Earth will allow you to dig metal out of it and um you know and metal will bring water or put, i don't understand how that works i've read it all the time but i don't understand how metal generates water but anyway let's not um in any case so they all correlate with organs so the heart is fire and as kevin was saying like you know the emotion associated with the heart is joy but you can also get pathological joy and um you know, an example of that that I would give is perhaps when someone laughs too much or, or they say like they're really upset about something. You know, when somebody laughs, they're upset and they laugh. That is, to me, pathological joy. That's when joy is not in harmony. It's, it, it's a negative emotion in that case. Um, and it correlates with all these. You can see there's different, if you look here, you can see they all correspond with a different element, with a different... Um, season um, and, and with a different uh, mindset. So you can see here, <clears throat> if we look at wood, if we start here, the um, transformation that occurs with wood, which is in the liver. And by the way, when I talk about organs here, I don't mean the organs themselves. I'm talking about energetic systems. It's nothing to do with your liver per se, or your heart per se, or although it can be. Um, but here, this is birth. And you can see if you have birth, the next emotion, this is wood. So wood nourishes fire. It feeds fire. It gives fuel for the fire. And birth will lead to growth. Growth, in turn, will lead to transformation and so on and so forth. So you can see there's a cycle. And you can go into the pathology of this. You can understand about imbalances on a deeper level by looking at, you know, perhaps where things are not nourishing each other. So for example, um, perhaps your fire is not in check. Perhaps you're too hot and you know, you're feeling you have emotional upsets and things like that. It may be that actually the kidney is out of balance. The water is out of balance and not keeping the fire in check. So rather than bringing the fire down, you may want to nourish the water. So it's about understanding where you are in balance or, or out of balance for that matter as well. So I'll let you read this here, and then I'll let you think about, we can have a discussion about, um, oh, sorry, I did it again. <laughs> um, you know, about the five phases and, um, and thinking of ways to rebalance. And you can also ask me questions if you wish to. Um, Anyone? No? Okay, so I'll, um, I'll carry on. We're almost at the end now. There's a few things I didn't talk about because I, I was a bit worried about time. 
And, um, you know, and as Ashif pointed out, there are techniques, and I wanted to talk a bit about physical cultivation and diet and all of that, but I thought seeing as the trajectory was philosophy, I'd just stick with that. So, but, you know, if anyone wants to talk to me about that afterwards, I'm very happy to talk about it, but I'll carry on for now. Um, so Sun Si Miao and how to manage illness. Um, Ashif, I think this may um, answer your question as well. So Sun Si Miao, as I mentioned, he was a physician and uh, he was considered the king of medicine. And this is what he says about managing and finding balance. First, you thoroughly understand the source of the dis-ease. That's what disease means. It means a lack of ease. And you understand what has been violated. Then you use food to treat it. If food won't cure it, then afterwards apply drugs. The nature of drugs is harsh and unyielding. This is like managing soldiers, being harsh and violent. How could you just recklessly allow them to set out? So what he's saying basically is, first determine what's out of balance. Where are you out of balance? Can your lifestyle or activities reharmonize? Which activities, which lifestyle changes do you need to make to re-establish balance? If you need intervention beyond that, can you try and manage it through food? I remember the first Sangha, um, it was the very first one that you guys did, and there was a lady talking about um, this wonderful like tea, this, this elixir, and she gave the recipe for it. And I remember it really resonated with me because she used the word soup. She was like, we'll drink this soup. And that is exactly what it was. It was not medicine, it was soup, it was food. So you find ways of incorporating through your diet the nutrients and medicinals that you need. So it may be that you add turmeric for inflammation, or you might add, um, I don't know, something like spinach if you need more iron, if you're anemic, or whatever. But it's about trying to do that with food. Finally, if none of those things reharmonize, then you go, you know, to what Brian was saying, then you go to the med medical systems, you go and get the outside help. First, you try believing in yourself and finding what will be right. And then if it doesn't work, you seek assistance. And it's okay to do that as well, to take assistance when it's needed. That's also part of balance. Yeah, you know? yeah um, so, two things. Uh, first, the, the woman you referred to, Melinda, she's in the Sacred uh -huh. Valley of Peru. Um, oh, yeah. Urubamba. And her, her video, you guys, if you guys want to see the elixir, the soup, uh, that, that the recipe that she gave us, it's, it's on the video chat. Um, and then, you know, even when you're seeking um, medicinal treatment, it, I think it's, you know, even then it's important to, to kind of, you know, what, what, even Brian's saying it's like believe in your trust yourself even when you're kind of like analyzing the the different medicinal situations to to go into um mm -hmm. it's important to trust yourself then too and you kind of interview them <laughs> and not just you know I immigrated to the states and for my mom it's like the doctors had all the answers you know um and you kind of follow blindly so even then, it's really good to trust yourself and, and deduce what and, and, and seek counsel from, from the people that you love and you, you admire and respect, you know. Uh, that's when community becomes even more important, you know. Um, and I think it's really, really important. And it's something I tell all my patients, actually. I say, please ask. Ask the doctor why you're being given this medicine. Understand what is going be happening to you when you take this medicine and why you're taking it don't just take it because anyone can tell you to take anything understand it and do it from an informed perspective you right. know it goes back to that theistic and non-theistic approach to health so whereas the doctor knows and will fix you or the non-theistic approach where the doctor teaches you and in fact in in the tcm paradigm the doctor is supposed to lead by example actually so in terms of cultivating your nature in terms of nurturing life the doctor has to do that the first step comes from nurturing your own life optimizing your own health and leading by example and the patient is never viewed as a passive subject they are actually viewed as a helper and i do have a quote for that somewhere um from the from the tao te ching and it says um if you just 
give me a minute. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and while, you, while you're looking for it, um, you know, just when you're seeking that counsel and, and you're kind of like, I mean, that's just a different perspective. When people talk about the term clinical, it's generally cold <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it's, uh, it's not in nurturing, you know, things were very done, very like clinical. That's my, at least my, my feeling of it in, in, in the West, you know, it's like, that's the, the approach to that word. And when you're receiving, sometimes, you know, I talk to friends that go to the doctor and the doctor's sharing information, but they don't really even, it doesn't even really resonate. You know, it's, uh, they're speaking another language sometimes. Um, so I like this approach as like working together, you know, um, the, the doctor and the, like working together, the client and, and, and the doctor that you're referring to. And it also, for me, it also, um, a lot of what you said, um, being that I've spent more time studying some, some yoga history and older practices, <clears throat> reminds me a lot of how yoga was prescribed, you know, historically more so. You know, an individual would go to yoga practitioner or guru, <clears throat> and you would get a prescription of asanas, of pranayamas to do you know, to address the specific health needs that your body had. This is, of course, changed today where we have classes and everyone does things uniform. That's how we teach today. But um, there, there's a lot of history behind the yoga practitioner that you would kind of take these practices and then work on healing yourself, you know. And so progressively, you would kind of come into the healing that way, which is one parallel. And then even what you were talking about back, talking about um, Lao Tzu, very similar, like for Patanjali, you know, they don't really, I don't think we really know if, it, if that was a person or if it's a collection of kind of ideas that came together around this. So there are just a lot of interesting parallels in the approach and in the, and in the history and in, in the lore of how the information was, has been, has been um, carried down as well. Yeah, for me, it would be very, very interesting to try and, um, you know, sort of, make those connections join those dots i would love to um yeah it's a, you know. let's do that <laughs> we have a project tara <laughs> it's a workshop actually <laughs> only if you <laughs> talking about, yeah it's a good workshop all right anyway won't go down that okay. rabbit hole so we have in closing some pearls of wisdom from chi bo who is the Yellow Emperor's Muse. This was the guy, you know, the idea with the Yellow Emperor's, with the Huangdi Neijing, which is that book, the classic of internal medicine. And it's based in two books. The first part is called the Su Wen, or Essential Questions. And it's basically conversations between the Yellow Emperor and Qi Bo, his counselor, or, or you know, guider, or whatever you want to call him. And it's actually, if you think about this, like it's so important what we've been talking about now in terms of the importance of these thoughts, these philosophies, these um, ideals, that a whole book was put on it. If you look at the Ling Shu or spiritual access, which is the second part of the book, that talks about acupuncture and bone measurements and all that stuff. But there's a whole first part um, which just addresses on this. But anyway, this is his wisdom. And it says, as for people in the most ancient past, they modeled themselves after yin and yang, harmonized their actions, knew the perfect measure in their food and drink, had constancy in their periods of rest and activity, and did not recklessly tax their bodies by physical activity. There was this idea of balance. The reason, and this is so applicable to today as well, even though this was 3000 years ago, the reason why people of our present times are not like this is that they exhaust their essence because of their desires. They scatter the genuine because of their squandering lifestyle. They do not know how to preserve the state of fullness. They live in the service of pleasing their hearts and thereby go against true joy in their life. So the take home there is find balance. And I'm just going to close with one of my favorite quotes, which is by a person called Fritov Kapra. And he says, um, mystics understands the root of the Tao, but not its branches. And scientists understand the branches of the Tao, but not its roots. 
Mysticism doesn't need science, and science doesn't need mysticism, but man needs both. So, so yeah, I'm just going to leave you with that. And um, I've got a reading list here, and if anyone wants further reading references, I'm happy to give them, but there's some really interesting books here. I find them interesting anyway, um, if anyone wants to make a note of them. I want to thank you all so much for coming, and please do feel free to ask questions. There's so much more that we could have talked on those, you know, like talking about those parallels. There's the three jewels, which are Qi, Shen, and Jing, which correlate to Dharma Sangha Buddha, and also within the Taoist text as well. There's physical and sexual cultivation. There's so many things we can talk about, but I have to cut it somewhere. So, so thank you very much and for your time and attention. And for those of you who've taken the time to come, even from other countries, I really appreciate um, you coming to share with me tonight. And, um, and it's been wonderful to, to do this. Thank you guys. Um, Amazing presentation, Tara. Um, I'm just gonna share your website here in the chat right now. So um, if people wanna, wanna follow up, um, could you talk a little bit actually about, well, I'll, I'll open it up before we go that route because there's a lot of fresh content there. I would like to hear a little bit more about your work and your practice in Nairobi. And we have some people here chiming in from Nairobi, Kenya, but we can open up the floor if there's anything related to, to, to other content that was shared um, this evening time for us here in Nairobi. Does anyone have any questions or feedback? Or comments they'd like to share? Um, there's several comments on the appreciation of your presentation in the chat, <laughs> uh, Tara. Uh, oh, thank you guys. Um, Brian wants to know if your PowerPoint is available. Yes, absolutely. I can share it. Um, shall I just email it to Salim or how, how should I do it? That's yeah. To do it. Um, I think he knows Brian pretty well. So you can okay. probably. Yeah. Absolutely, that would be great. If you Thank send me you, an email, I'll forward it to to Dad. <laughs> I can't call him Brian. The other was weird. <laughs> um, yeah, and I definitely want to see it as well. Um, but I'm going to watch the recording once again um, later this evening, whenever we're done recording here. Um, and so Tar just shared on the chat. Our Salim shared her website and Tara, you're going to speak a little bit about your work in Kenya, you were saying. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, of particular interest, you can share in general about your work, but I think if for those that were at in, the, in, in here for the introduction, um, Tara, you also specialize on infertility or fertility, maybe I should say, using acupuncture for that. And I think that's really interesting. I, I don't know anyone else who, who um, really focuses specifically on that, that area to the extent that you do. So that's interesting to me. I think people might like to hear about that. Um, and maybe, I mean, you know, I don't know if I have a sp specific question beyond that, be, um, within that, but I'm curious maybe why, and also what you're kind of what you're finding or what your approach is towards um, trying to support um, women and, and men as well through that process? So in order to support people, like, um, again, it goes back to this idea of optimization. Um, so we look at where there's areas of imbalance, and that could be pathological. I haven't really talked about pathology today, but you can actually break it down into yin yang, qi blood, um, or, you know, the other, there's a few pathological factors, heat, damp, and it doesn't matter what terminology you use, you could use blocked tubes, for example, blocked fallopian tubes, or you could say stasis of blood, it doesn't matter which language you use, but it kind of means different things, but the approach is different um, according to how each person comes. So each person is looked at individually, and I would never look at uh, infertility or let's say as you say i don't like using the word infertility i prefer to say fertility or trying to optimize fertility and i wouldn't look at it as um as an illness per se but perhaps as a symptom of an imbalance so it's always about digging deeper i equate it to peeling the layers of an onion in a way so you say why is this happening where is the imbalance why is there a blockage or why is there a hormonal imbalance why is you know 
perhaps um, if it's male factor infertility, you know, why is the sperm count low or so on and so forth. There's a reason for that. It's an imbalance somewhere. So it's then trying to find where the imbalance is and figure out ways to optimize that. And that could be all these lifestyle changes, yang sheng, basically, as well as balancing through acupuncture, as well as possibly uh, a multidisciplinary approach if it's called for, um, you know, looking at all the ways that we can optimize um, someone. And I, you know, I always tell people, don't come and expect something to happen at once, let me say. You know, this is a progress because if there is an imbalance, you have to rebalance and rebalance doesn't happen overnight especially if something's been going on for many many years even so you know i equate studying for an exam you know you can go and sit the exam and um and you may ace it but if you haven't prepared you know there's less chance of acing it and if you have prepared there's more chance of acing it so you're more able to get to your goal and if that goal for example is conception pregnancy a full-time you know a, a full-term birth then it is about preparing yourself managing those imbalances to the point where your body just allows what is going to happen to happen and you know if we take that beyond fertility into pregnancy even you know i mean there's all these questions about perhaps if you're not in optimal health what is the health of your children going to look like? And that comes into this idea of Jing. And Jing, translated, it means essence. But it could um, also refer to, you know, on a very broad level, genetic makeup. So if you are not in a good state, then, you know, then perhaps that will reflect in the DNA, in the Jing that you pass on to your children. And going back to self-care and observing through nature, the prescription for pregnant women in ancient China was to look at beautiful paintings and listen to nice music and walk in nature because it was the idea of surrounding yourself with beauty and wonderful things. So that would be passed on to your unborn yeah. children. And I love I that. Love, I love yeah. that. And I feel like there's a, a return, you know, that people are kind of coming back into some of that awareness. Both of my children, for example, were home births. Um, I, I held my kid's mom when she gave birth to my daughter and I caught my son. And, you know, so just, you know, the fact that the information is starting to come in and the value of creating spaces that are, for me as well, having a woman, um, you know, practitioner, midwife, and for her was very important as well. Um, that's, that's amazing. And, and what I do, the other thing that strikes me kind of about you, I'm just interested in you. I think like it's a good chance for kind of you to share a little bit. Like you have such an inquisitive mind. I feel like you're like someone who likes to figure out sort of, maybe not the best analogy, but kind of put the puzzle together somehow, you know, and, you know, kind of really naturally inquisitive, which you don't always Fine with health practitioners, <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's like, all right, let's get on to the next client, you know, the next patient, you know, but you really, you know, want to go in and understand these things. And I think that um, really makes you a really strong healer and, and practitioner. Um, and seems like an important, really important quality for any healer yeah. and health practitioner, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't always have that experience, you know? Most people call it nitpicking. They're just like, can you just stop now? <laughs> stop asking questions about myself. <laughs> I don't, I'm not ready. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it is something that does interest me. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I love figuring out puzzles. And I do have an analytical nature. I like to... And I'm organized, I'm a Virgo. I like to have things just so if there's things, you know, so for me, putting things in place and finding those anomalies and fixing them is part of me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Tara, at the moment uh, with your practice, are, are you open to like consultations over Zoom and, and things like that of that nature? So I'm actually working at the moment, um, physically working. So I'm not doing Zoom consultations. Um, I'm actually in clinic, but I'm just taking limited numbers of clients in a day so that we can practice good hygiene and disinfect the room between people and stuff like that. 
Yeah, um, I, I look forward to, to keeping this conversation going and, and learning more from you, um, you know, in, in a workshop space. You know, um, I, I like this um, approach that's this conversation that's taking place of like going back to nature and retreating to ourselves um, and, you know, kind of like questioning what is serving us in our culture and what is not. Um, we have a question here uh, from Eleanor. Who's a, she's in Washington, D.C. Um, she wants to know uh, if you have some practical tips uh, for how one can cultivate the balance of positive emotions in the face of negative emotions, anger, anxiety within this tradition. So, you know, there's so many, this goes back to what Ashif was asking as well, and it's about what techniques are there. And, you know, the simple answer is just to do what feels good for your body um, that isn't harmful to your body. And it, it basically goes down to breathing, eating yeah. well, meditation. You know, it's those simple key facets. There's no magic, esoteric kind of special thing that you can do. You know, there are aspects of that. And if you go into like the spiritual sides of Taoism as opposed to the philosophical sides, there are all these esoteric practices that you can do, which I'm no expert on, you know, I can't um, necessarily give you too much information about that because I don't know enough about it. But the basics, you know, I would say just go back to basic health. So if you are feeling anger, it would be about first finding why you're angry or trying to understand why, where have you become out of balance? What caused the anger? Is it stemming from fear? Is it stemming from anxiety? You've mentioned anxiety. You know, so then going again deeper, why am I anxious? Why am I fearful? When you figure out exactly what's going on, you try and work on that. You try and develop that. You try and acknowledge it and process it. And it could be as simple as managing it through, you know, an endorphin rush by doing exercise. It could be as simple as making sure you get regular meals or enough sleep or, you know, making sure you do something that you enjoy, you know. And, and it, it really is as simple as that. It's these basic little things. You know, it might be having a hot shower and a cup of tea instead of cooking for the kids or whatever, you know, and telling them to like, you know, it could be anything. But it is basically those simple everyday things that you can do. There's nothing special. Sometimes, you know, if it goes beyond that, then that's when you go and seek the help. And, and that's what they were saying about first you use, first you figure out where there's imbalance, then you try and cure it through lifestyle. Then you try and cure it through food. And that kind of goes hand in hand. And, and lifestyle will include things like meditation and, and all of that stuff as well. And if none of that works, then you find help from other interventions, whether it's acupuncture, whether it's orthodox medicine, whether it's energy healing, whatever you choose that works for you. But it's about doing it step by step and with mindfulness and intention and, and learning from it as well so not just saying this is anger it's bad but you know recognizing that anger is a part of everyone it's it's an emotion that's there it's part of human nature so trying to embrace that as well and learn from it and move forward and develop as a human being by what it's teaching you mm. as well so yeah there's no specific yeah. techniques apart from the basics <laughs> that is you know that is, that is so on point and and uh you know i think some of us sometimes we're we've been kind of trained to listen to like these like clinical kind of very cerebral answers um and and uh, you know a lot of it is like finding what works and then in a way second nature um and and continue to observe yourself um you know back to this does that answer your question eleanor does that give you a little insight um okay um, yeah, just going back to nature, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and, you know, she had breast cancer and she's talking to Papa Benito, one of like the shamans, uh, and, you know, the word shaman is kind of a little bit, there's so many different takes on it nowadays. Cause you can like, you know, just grow up in the suburbs of Virginia and then, uh, go do a three month shaman course, you know, um, which is a little different. Um, this gentleman that I'm referring to doesn't speak Spanish. He like has barely seen Western civilization. And he told my friend to walk in the morning dew barefooted by the Lucuma tree. 
every day, this like thousand year old lucuma tree in the garden. And after doing that and taking certain herbs that he had prescribed for her, you know, she, be, she healed. Um, so there's, you know, this return to nature and this return to these old traditions that is resurfacing and being echoed. And, and I really appreciate your respect for it and the way, I mean, I know that if we get in a deeper conversation, you can reference a lot of things that probably like confuse my mind a little bit but I really appreciate you keeping it really clear <laughs> and, uh, and really like about the, you know, maintaining the, the, the importance and the reverence for these observations, which at first glance seem kind of simple, but have so much depth to them. So thank you for that. And I think it's simple, but it's complex as well. It's just, you know, to just take that simplicity and to acknowledge that actually that's all there is, you know, um, can be hard as well, I think, to say, okay, well, all I need to do is, I don't know, eat more spinach and less cheese sandwiches, you know, it can actually be hard to say, really, it's as simple as that, I just need to do that, for God's sake, like, you know, I need something beyond that. But it's about recognizing that we have the power to, to look after ourselves on, on a basic level. I'm not, that's a very big generalization. There are times when you need extra support, but I'm talking about the day-to-day -day basics. Right. You know, we have that power to, to take yeah. care. I have another. And we should. And we should. Sorry, oh, yeah. go ahead. Sure, I have another. Yeah. I'm putting ahead, some things, things together I hadn't before, but I have another thought of technique that I, that I use. We, in fact, a few, Last month or a month or so ago, we did a vortex meditation as on the Sangha, in which people went into a deep place inside of themselves. So my belief is that we each have in us an internal healer. Yeah. That is, in, it's, I hadn't thought about it as an innate part of myself, but I'm getting that. I'm getting now. I'm, it's an interesting idea for me to, to work with. But, but I, so certainly for me, there, there are several internal healers that I rely on. And I meditate and go into a place like the, the vortex meditation or the mountaintop meditation or the forest meditation or the cave meditation where I put myself inside of myself in a meditation in a deep place in myself and sit with whoever, in, in my case, it's my healer. I've identified as Sojourner Truth as one of them. And we sit and we talk and I ask questions and I, so I, I, and I ask questions about my, my state of mind and my physical and she, she tells me. And what I've found is that I take her first answer and I don't second guess. And I take myself out of the meditation and then work that. So I found myself, I, went, I had a problem with my knee and I went into a meditation. I got a message about what to do about my knee. And I went to the Mayo Clinic and said, do you have you? They were going to do some, some they were thinking about surgery. And I said, well, what about turmeric? <laughs> and the doctor looked at me and said, well, I have, there is a little research that turmeric can help out osteoarthritis in the knee. Go ahead and try it. And so I'm now walking two miles a day and they wanted to do surgery. So, and that's sort of an example because I think that we have in ourselves internal healers, voices that we don't pay attention to or trust that, that are as good as the external healers out there in, in Mayo Clinic ultimately and are, are self-empowering which is, I think, the key to it. Um, so that's just an idea that I think there's a way in which we can learn to trust ourselves and to go into places where we hear that internal healer who will tell us what to do and give us some clues at least as to what to do that we can come back out into this world and work with. At least that's been true for me. Very much so. And, um, I, you know, it, it, it does go back to that trust yourself thing and, um, and listen to yourself and honor yourself. You know, a surgeon will always advocate surgery because that's what they've been taught to do. A herbalist will always advocate herbs because that's what they've been taught to do. And acupuncturists will always advocate acupuncture because that's what they've been taught to do. Yeah. But it's about listening to all the options and then listening to yourself and saying, right, this is the right way for me. And, and really trusting in that. And, um, and making, yeah, it's about informed choice, I would say. But, but that informed choice, that understanding comes from inside. I do remember your meditation, by the way, Bryant. Um, 
I was on a raft and I didn't want to get out of the vortex. I didn't want to go down. I just wanted to stay surfing on that. <laughs> it was scary to go down, but yeah. it was great. So um, uh, for you guys that, uh, you know, we referenced Brian's med guided meditation, it's, uh, it's in the video also on, on, on the Synergy website. So if you want to tap into that, it's another wonderful tool. Um, and, you know, we're trying to create more of these support systems for one another. And, you know, I, I definitely encourage you guys to go through there and see what, what resonates with you. Um, it's been a really wonderful dialogue, T Tara. Um, really beautiful synergy circle here today. Um, and we have a couple of more questions, uh, you know, regarding uh, if you have illness or disease, uh, can a person have illness or disease while they have harmony? Um, and uh, absolutely. Well, I mean, disease is disharmony. Illness is disharmony. It's imbalance. But we're never one or the other. It goes back to that, that yin yang. You know, you will have harmony in some areas, but you can still have illness in other areas. So you may be supremely, I mean, this is, you know, perhaps an example that, you know, I'm not trying to cause any sensitive issues here. But like, for example, you know, they say breast cancer can be to do with emotion. So you could be having a really healthy lifestyle, but you could have, you know, a lot of pent up emotion, which is held here. Yeah. And that can manifest or, or, you know, nothing is black and white. You could have, um, you know, you could be really, really fit and well, but not um, have a voice, you know, not speak. And then you might get perhaps hypo or hyperthyroidism, or you could simply have genetic disorders. But then it comes back to um, epigenetics. You may be prone to getting an illness of some kind. It's there. It's, it's part of who, what makes us unique. So you can be harmonious in all aspects and recognize that that's also part of you so you can even though illness is always in balance and you try to bring balance back but there's always both sides you know and and that's very common you know and even in the patterns you'll never have an excess pattern or a deficient pattern or a hot pattern or a cold pattern or only liver or only heart or only fire or only water it will always be a mixture because we are a mixture and we're always in a state of flux so that harmony will fluctuate as well. Different areas will become harmonized and different areas will become unharmonized, so to speak. So yes, yes, you can, but the idea is to get perfect harmony so you don't get ill. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Tara. That, that brings up the koshas. For me, like, you know, my studies more in Ayurveda and it brings up the koshas a little bit. Like the Manomaya kosha is more emotions. Uh, Ananda Maya Kosha, the blissful body, like the different bodies, you know, so one can be harmonized and then the other, so this can happen together. Um, really appreciate this presentation and you opening up your heart and sharing your studies with us today. Um, we're going to uh, finish the recording for now and um, 